This is Duke University. This week on Office Hours, lessons in college can come as often from friends and mentors outside of class as from instructors and books inside of class. As Duke's Dean of Undergraduate Education, Steve Nowicki is responsible for coordinating the extracurricular and curricular aspects of undergraduate life. One major project Nowicki is overseeing is the revision of the university's student residential assignment system. Nowicki takes your questions about living and learning at college. Welcome to Office Hours. I'm Sarah Kruger, a Duke senior and a production assistant here at the show. Joining me today is Steve Nowicki, the Dean and Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Also joining me is Pete Shork, another Duke senior and the president of Duke Student Government. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. So the idea of the house model has kind of resurfaced again today with the Chronicle's editorial board coming out with a rather unique opinion, saying that in order for the house model to succeed, Duke will need to do away with all residential selective living groups. So that's kind of a unique opinion. I, I will admit I serve on this board, um, but I'm curious to know what y'all's responses are. Um, so starting off with you, Dean Nowicki, what, what do you think about that? Well, um, I, I'd, I'd say two things. One is that um, I was pleased that the editorial board's opinion was very much in favor of the transition to the house model, mm -hmm. and I acknowledge the challenges that integrating unaffiliated and affiliated houses will present. Um, Interestingly, uh, about five years ago, um, a committee, the so-called Campus uh, Climate um, uh, Initiative Committee, came up with the same recommendation. Um, it was not a unanimous recommendation. In fact, that committee never agreed to any one particular set of recommendations. But that got published, and it created quite a stir in the uh, student community, as well as alum community, parent community, uh, a stir that basically said, no, we really want to have social selective as part of the mix. Mm -hmm. And Pete, what do you think about that? Did the editorial board get it right, or are they kind of missing mm -hmm. the mark of student opinion? Yeah, well, I, I think just from a student's perspective, um, I, I think students would probably be a majority in favor of keeping selectives. But one of the things that I thought was kind of ironic about the perspective um, is here they are lauding the, lauding the house model, uh, which really is trying to uh, offer the advantages of selectives to uh, unaffiliated students. Um, having common themes in your house, having that sense of community you might find in a selective. And so my own personal opinion about it was, was that um, you know, the house model is almost offering the benefits that we've seen of having selective living groups on campus. Um, so perhaps in a couple years down the line, we'll see when all, uh, you know, all houses are kind of experiencing those benefits, um, you know, we might see a different perspective from the one that was presented today. Right. And as you all both well know more than anyone, the house model has seen some skeptics and some advocates. So Dean Nowicki, can you briefly outline why you think this house model is a good idea and, and what you hope it accomplishes? Sure, it actually goes directly um, to the point that the Chronicle editorial made today. Um, the challenge of the social selectives here at Duke has uh, long been that some minority of students live in a housing system that gives them privileges. The most notable privilege is that uh, those students in so-called SLGs will know where they're living and they can go back there year after year. So they develop a sense of home, uh, whereas the independents don't have that privilege and are frankly uh, you know, forced to get a lottery number every year and figure out the best they can where they end up. So the point of transitioning um, back to a house-based system. And I'll remind uh, you that we used to have a house-based mm -hmm. system here in the uh, 80s through the early 90s, is to um, redress that imbalance, not by bringing the social selectives uh, or the students who live in them down to the low level of privilege and um, uh, predictability, but to try to bring everybody up. Mm -hmm. So by telling everybody you can get into a house and if you like it, you can stay there for mm -hmm. the rest of your time at Duke and every house in the long run, we'll have you know, the same level of amenities. It's going to take a few years to get there. Mm -hmm. I'll add one more thing, and that is that uh, change is always challenging. There would be no point in the life of a complicated, large uh, university like this where everybody agreed this is the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And the same was seen when we transitioned. Um, this was before I was an administrator, but I was here as a professor. Transitioned to create the first year 
campus, on East Campus, there was a huge outcry um, about that, against it. Mm -hmm. um, two years later, everybody decided actually they loved it. Um, change just is a little nerve-wracking, and I appreciate that. Right. Mm -hmm. And Pete, from a student's perspective, have you noticed any of the same complaints? And, and what complaints have you seen about the quad model that maybe justify a, mm -hmm. a transition to this new model? Yeah, I mean, specific to the, to the quad model, I think you know, one of the concerns that administrators and students share is that there really isn't a sense of social autonomy um, over your immediate social and living space. And so what you're going to see is by reducing the size of quads and condensing it into smaller houses, you're going to have... Uh, you know, what would it be about 80 houses, 70 houses, and each one of them is going to have their own governance unit. And so I think st there's going to be a much more participatory process uh, whereby, you know, students are actively engaged in planning things for the residential space, getting to know one another, and not just having, you know, housing be the shell where you, you know, live and sleep every night and return to, but kind of being the, the nexus for social activity. So, um, you know, you know, as far as getting back to Steve's point, Steve, uh, uh, Dean Nowicki was talking about how, um, you know, basically um, students are are concerned about um, uh, the the. Uh, just lost my train of thought. Uh, what, what, were, what were you just briefly mentioning? You were talking about well, what? trying to um, create the same level of privilege in terms of predictability right. of knowing right. where you're going to live another, for everybody. Right, right. And another thing you were talking about was uh, this concern of. Uh, transition and we just and one of the things that I want to talk about today was we just did this survey um, in, in, which basically said that students were divided on, on the house model which actually I think is a pleasant surprise because as you mentioned in the transition to, to East Campus um, there was actually quite an, a, an uproar and so I think a lot of people are kind of tentatively optimistic um, they're, they're, they're thinking actively about how they're going to have uh, a, a larger opportunity to engage with this kind of participatory style of house governance that I mentioned. So I, I think, you know, I would say people are tentatively optimistic and kind of waiting to see what this opportunity might, might present them. Right. Yeah. And we'd like to remind our viewers that you all can participate in this conversation by tweeting with the hashtag Duke Live, posting a question to the Duke University Facebook page, or emailing in your questions to live at duke.edu. So kind of touching on that point, um, as an alternative to the House model, DSG, Duke Student mm -hmm. Government, came up with a plan they call Continuing Communities. Um, and that a recent survey showed that students don't really support that either. Mm -hmm. And as you all already have said, change is difficult no matter how you come about it. But how do you all plan to work together in the future to, to ensure that students have a model they're pleased with? First to you, Pete. Sure. So uh, to, to be clear and specifically address continued community, that was a model that basically said uh, coming in um, out of freshman year into sophomore year, you could join uh, a, a, a house or set of houses with people from your same freshman dorm. Because a lot of us on the executive board of student government realized that we had such special freshman experiences on that campus, and you know why couldn't we continue those um, on to sophomore year? Well, so students were actually divided on that, but because it limited student choice, uh, they were divided about 50-50, but because it limits student choice, it, it doesn't really seem like a good idea to uh, fully implement that um, and limit student choice in that way. And that's something that, that Dean Nowicki has been very um, conscious of, and, and myself as well. We don't really want to limit student choice. So I think going forward, we're going to look at maybe how to have a hybrid of that because, again, half students were in, in favor of that model, um, mm -hmm. or, or just kind of actively thinking about how we can refine um, you know, the models generally to, to try to get some of those benefits uh, that people saw in their freshman year community experience. Right, yeah. right. I would, I would agree um, with Pete. I would add, Sarah, that um, I've been fortunate since this discussion began, literally four years ago, to have some great uh, student leaders to work with. And, um, you know, this began with, when um, a student named Molly Bierman, a Pratt student, was the head of what was then campus council, who really worked with me to start some of the first uh, town hall meetings that led to the idea of creating some sort of house mm -hmm. system. Um, and what we're doing now, uh, working with Pete and his colleagues, is to continue that um, discussion. So we have a very active working group. You know, Now that we're set to launch next fall in this new residential system, we know that there are a number of follow-ons that we have to keep working on. And so uh, Pete and his successor, mm -hmm. when uh, we have new elections, will continue to work with me and my team um, to garner more student input um, and to adjust 
the model, we'll be looking at ways to really assess whether we're achieving the creation of a stronger sense of community mm -hmm. tie. Uh, and if not, then um, we'll adjust as necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a residential model is not unique at Duke or at other universities, but many other universities such as Harvard and Yale and Rice all have about 12 or 13 houses, whereas Duke is looking like we're gonna have more than 70. Mm -hmm. So how do you all think this will factor into creating those distinctive communities that, that we hope for? Dean Nowicki? Well, I'd say that um, a simple answer would be that we will have more and smaller communities which could help foster a greater sense of pluralism. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the number and size of our houses, to be quite honest, is partly set by the, um, the real estate we have available. I mm -hmm. mean, when Duke's uh, West Campus was built, um, you know, almost 100 years ago, well, maybe 80 years ago, um, the nature of those Gothic residences were, uh, they, they were conceived of as vertical houses, but very small units. Um, and so as we thought about this transition back to a house model, uh, we asked, where would the real estate naturally divide? Mm -hmm. um, if I could start from scratch and rebuild the university, which is not on the table, um, <laughs> you know, I would probably aim for houses to all be in the range of 60 to 80 people because that's the size of a group where you can actually comfortably know everybody easily. Right. Uh, they're not your best friends. They're not close uh, associates anyway, but you're familiar with them. You recognize them. You know many mm -hmm. of their names. and So that's where it came from. And it's a little different at... Um, you know, uh, Rice, for example, where the entities are much larger, there is a sense of identity, but not as personal a sense. And I think the same is true of Harvard or Yale. Pete, do you generally agree with those statements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I also see some advantages to having more houses um, because it gets back to student choice and having options. And I think that, you know, the goal of this model is, is not to just have you know, uh, 70 new houses. It's to develop 70 new, vibrant, unique communities. So I, I think that that's actually something that uh, one positive benefit of, of having uh, more houses available is you might have a, a more kind of uh, varied uh, cultural outcome from this. Right. Yeah. And we'd like to remind our viewers that you can participate in this conversation by sending in your questions via email to live at duke.edu posting to the Duke University Facebook page, or tweeting in with the hashtag DukeLive. We've gotten one email from Jack. He says, I know a high school student who is thinking about attending Duke. Do you think this new house model makes Duke more desirable than some similar universities? To you, Dean Nowicki? Well, I mean, I'd have to say the answer is yes, and that's <laughs> not surprising. I, we wouldn't have gone down this road if we didn't think it was going to generally improve student life. I think that... Um, the way that I hope that it improves students' li students lives here and why I think it'll make Duke an even better university than it is already is that it's going to be one way that we continue to blend the students' lives in the classroom with their lives outside of the classroom because that's really the um, that's that's really the high ground of um, uh, American higher education for the coming century. Mm -hmm. We used to think of, you know, getting a college degree as passing a certain number of courses with a certain number of requirements, and then everything else you did would be sort of gravy on top of that. But in the modern world we live in, we want to connect what students are doing in the classroom with the real world. Now, the house system is just one of many ways that we're trying to um, push Duke forward to enable them to do that. So if we have communities... Uh, of 60 or 80 students, then we can use those as a framework to better connect the, the lives and the work of faculty and teaching to the students' experience in their residence halls. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the goals of the house model is to incentivize seniors to stay on campus for their last mm -hmm. year. And I know Pete and I are both seniors and we both live off campus. Um, so how do, how do you plan on kind of making that mm -hmm. a more attractive option to seniors? Um, before I answer that, I'll say that, that it is a loss for Duke and similar uh, colleges and universities to have seniors live off campus because the seniors are the people who have that experience. Mm -hmm. And for seniors to be mixing it up with younger students is just another way to enhance education. Um, it's a challenge because uh, for um, residence halls that were built here 80 years ago, 
Uh, nobody was thinking anybody would want to move off campus, mm -hmm. and so the rooms are small, and the bathroom is 100 yards down the hallway, and so what senior would want to live there when they can find an apartment mm -hmm. that's just off campus? Mm -hmm. One of the things we're doing as we renovate space and as we build new space, such as our new residence hall, K4 as it's called, is to really intentionally build space that seniors would want to live in. Mm -hmm. So for example, K4, the new residence hall, has a very high proportion of its rooms as singles, and many of those are in small suites of their own. So it's almost like living in your own apartment within the residence complex. So it keeps seniors on campus by giving them space where they're understandably more mm -hmm. comfortable in, um, but in integrating that into the campus community. Mm -hmm. And Pete, as a senior, mm -hmm. if you had the option, for example, of, of living in this new dorm or a similar space, mm -hmm. do you think that would be enough to sway you, or what would it take on the part mm -hmm. of Duke? Well, first of all, the new dorm is tremendous, um, and, and the more of those we build, I, I mean, I'm sure we'll have no problem getting seniors to live on campus. But I actually think the house model uh, alone will bring seniors back to campus by providing kind of a, a mentorship infrastructure. Um, you know, it, uh, Dean Nowicki was kind of talking about this a little bit, that it's, it's unfortunate that we have uh, maybe half of seniors currently living off campus um, and you know, losing that opportunity to actively engage with underclassmen. And I think that the house model is going to definitely, uh, we will probably see 60 or, or more or percent or more uh, seniors coming back to the campus um, in large part because you're going to be creating, as I said before, kind of a, a smaller um, social hub for these students and clear opportunities for mentorship and, and interaction and really taking on an active role in these houses. So. Um, I, I think the model itself is going to bring people back and then also as we continue to build uh, kind of the residential infrastructure. So I'm definitely optimistic about that. And with that, we're going to turn now to a video segment um, discussing K4, Duke's newest dorm. The strongest connection between this building and our new residential model Duke Houses is that it's designed specifically with that approach in mind. So we specifically designed communities, one of 60, one of 90, which we felt were the appropriate size for a house to be. Each house has its own kitchen, study room, common room, so they're resourced in a way that we would like all houses to be. So I think we can all agree that K4 looks great. I mean, I wish I could live there. Um, are there any plans going forward to make more dorms like K4? I know it's kind mm -hmm. of a hard economic time, but... Um, well, I mean, we built K4 during the downturn, and the answer is yes. Uh, we, we have plans to continue to build in the long run, and I don't know how long it'll take to get there. Um, we have plans to build another thousand beds, to you know, which will substantially... Um, you know, create, uh, uh, you know, most of the campus being like K4. And then as we renovate older space, it's creating those K4-like moments that are really driving those renovations. Um, I can't say for sure when we'll start, but I would, I would hope that we have groundbreaking on another K4-like mm -hmm. residence on West Campus in a matter of years. I, 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 I'm an optimist. I would hope that an incoming freshman next year might have a chance to live in K-5, let's call it, uh, before they leave. And we'd like to remind our viewers that we're taking your questions live. You can tweet in with the hashtag DukeLive, email live at duke.edu, or post to the Duke University Facebook page. We've gotten in one question from Ron. He says, if Duke keeps building these fancy dorms, won't that just make Duke students more likely to spend all of their time on campus and not interact with the larger community in Durham? So, Pete, do you have a response to that? Sure. I mean, I, I think actually the level of students' engagement in Durham is pretty robust. Um, and, and, you know, one thing we're talking about on campus is, uh, you know, how can we even further support on-campus uh, social life in, in big ways? So, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I actually, in my time, even in my four years, I, I, I've seen student engagement in Durham kind of skyrocket. And I think it's going to stay that way, uh, especially with downtown becoming much more of a social hub. Um, so, you know, I, I really, uh, I'm not as concerned about that issue personally. Uh, Dean Nowicki? I think that's a really good question. And um, I won't say I'm deeply concerned, but I think we have to pay attention to that. So I'm a Durhamite. I've lived here for 22 years, almost 23 years. And I think that it is important for Duke to be connected to the Durham community in positive ways. Um, so as we try to build a life that will keep uh, seniors wanting to live on campus, I think we also have to think about how we make sure that we connect our students to the best of Durham. And there are ways that we're doing that already. So for example, we 
we subsidize uh, Duke students uh, buying tickets to um, events at places like DPAC, the new Durham Performing Arts Center, or the Carolina Theater, mm -hmm. or other venues in Durham. And we do that explicitly because uh, we want students to go and see the best of Durham. Um, I, I'm very proud to be a member of the Durham community because mm -hmm. I've seen Durham uh, become an increasingly fabulous place to live, and I think increasingly Duke students need to understand that, a, that an advantage of going to school at Duke is that they can take advantage of what great stuff that Durham has to offer. Right. And obviously the Duke experience stems from far more than just academics, as you well know in your position. So how do you kind of combine, how, how do residences play a role in continuing the Duke education outside of the classroom? Well, the answer to that is still being written. Um, as you know, um, in other work that I do, we're really pushing curricular innovations or curriculum-like innovations. So one example is we've instituted a few years ago um, uh, an event here uh, at, at Duke called the Winter Forum where we bring back um, you know, 100 or 120 Duke students a few days before the end of winter break and really immerse them with not just faculty but leaders from the real world on, on a problem that is you know, of, of global significance in a hands-on way. Um, that's not, they don't get credit for that. They just do it. And the reason they do it, they are interested in this, is because it allows uh, students to use what they're learning in the classroom to solve some real problem with the real people out in the world who are doing it. Mm -hmm. And I could name a number of other programs. Having a house-based residence system will provide us with a scaffolding in, which will allow us to better connect curricular innovations with the lives of students in their houses. And that we have a, a group of students and faculty working right now on ideas about how to do this. And I imagine that's going to be the work of a group of interested students and faculty for the next several years to come up with more ideas. My job will be to make sure that the residence system is um, fine-tuned to support those ideas and that if resources are needed, and by that I mean money, to support those ideas, that we find that as well. And Pete, as a student, can you speak to the importance of, of activities that take place outside of the classroom? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the things that really attracted me to Duke in the first place was that we had such a, a well-balanced and enriching experience, you know, whether that be in the classroom, uh, in Cameron Indoor, or in the many, you know, over 400 student groups we have here. So, um, I, I, you know, just as a personal, N equals one, uh, a sample size, uh, I personally, uh, have been incredibly fulfilled through my experiences in student government, working with administrators like um, Dean Nowicki, and I think many other students, um, you know, experience similar enrichment in, in their silos as well. So, uh, you know, it gets back to the house model, and I think the house model really, really is acknowledging the importance of out of classroom experiences and tying that into the residential model, as Dean Nowicki alluded to. Um, and so, you know, because it is a more holistic uh, residential model, um, I, I'm, I'm certainly optimistic about how it's going to support. Um, that extracurricular aspect as well. Right. Yeah. We've gotten a couple questions in via email. This one for Dean Nowicki from Stewart. He says, will a feature of the house model be competition between houses? Would debating competitions and charity drives, for example, be organized along inter-house lines? Could, could well be, or intramural sports. I mean, I think that um, uh, Duke students American college students tend to be a competitive bunch, mm -hmm. and, in the, and, and if taken in the positive, that competition can be a real healthy thing uh, to promote um, interaction and to get people uh, working together, you know, to compete with the other group. So um, if we have a competition, for example, an entrepreneurial startup competition mm -hmm. across houses, I think it could be fabulous if it was a way for those houses mm -hmm. to sort of cement their identity and draw the students together. Mm -hmm. Right, and something else um, that has been discussed a lot at Duke is the idea of a communal dining experience. And Pete, I think you may have mentioned that in your DSG campaign, and mm -hmm. I also believe last year's young trustee, Michelle Sohn, mm -hmm. talked a lot about that. Um, the house model seems perhaps conducive, at least in, in theory, maybe not architecturally, mm -hmm. to something like that. Are there any plans to make a communal dining experience at Duke? Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, you know, as you know, another um, thing that's uh, about to happen is a complete um, renovation of the West 
Campus Union building, mm -hmm. um, thanks to a, a fabulous charitable, dona charitable donation. Um, that building is going to be completely taken apart and rebuilt. Mm -hmm. It is the central facility for dining, and in the discussions about how to rebuild it, I mean, we're just in architect selection mode right mm -hmm. now, <laughs> but in discussions, we all agree that making sure that the dining uh, facilities of that reconfigured West Union um, can support house-based dining, mm -hmm. um, you know, to have actually a set of rooms that can be reserved on a house-wide ba house basis, um, uh, on a regular uh, basis, and, and ideas like that. Mm -hmm. And Pete, I know for students, you probably know as well as I do, that we like to have our options in dining. I like sure. the option of being able to go mm -hmm. to Subway or the right. Loop if I feel like mm -hmm. it, um, but how do you think a student response would be for something like communal dining? Communal dining. Um, I mean, I, I think that w one of the things you want to see with communal dining is the, uh, the maintaining the options that we've had all along and then just adding, like what right. Dean Nowicki said, uh, this option to dine communally. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, as Dean Nowicki said in the plans for, uh, for the, actually right above uh, where we want to have the main dining venues, in the plans for the new West Union building are these venues to dine, um, you know, with your house with friends, with faculty, uh, with administrators. Um, and we, we have a few rooms for that right now in our West Union building, but this, this new plan is really a lot more robust and really kind of, uh, we'll, we'll expand that, you know, three, threefold or so. Uh, you can expand venues for that threefold. So, uh, you know, I, I think students are, they, they currently take advantage of those opportunities through programs like the Flunch program, uh, where, where the university and, and student fee money actually subsidizes dining uh, you know, and incentivizes dining with faculty and administrators on behalf uh, on incentivizes students doing that. And so I think adding more venues for things like that is only going to further incentivize that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. We've gotten in another question from Mary um, for Dean Nowicki. She says, a lot of students think living on West is an important part of the Duke experience. Aren't you taking that away? Um, well, that's a fair question. And the answer partly is that it never has really been there. It depends on what you mean by West. I mean, there are some students who think that living in the Gothic dorms of Maine West is, um, you know, the peak of a Duke experience, but that's not guaranteed to Duke students right now. Mm -hmm. um, we will be um, having in the short run, and by that I might mean a number of years, to use Central Campus as part of our housing, but we've always done that. Um, in the long run, as we build new residences, the goal is not to add more students, but to move students out to Central. Um, I am concerned about student perceptions about what it means to be a Duke student, and so I do talk to students about what it is they value about any aspect of their experience mm -hmm. here, and including the residential experience. So. I have to acknowledge that it may be that some students will not live on West Campus. That is currently the case now. Uh, I don't think we'll be making it much different from that, but I'm interested in knowing what that really means. For example, I think that once a student has lived in our newest residence, K-4, they won't imagine wanting to ever live anywhere. In fact, <laughs> we're going to have to sort of push them out as right. seniors, I think. Um, so I think that the perception of where the hot place to live on campus will shift. And I would add, actually, that Central Campus, you know, three or four years ago was seen as an awful place, but in a, uh, a, a campus council mm -hmm. uh, survey done, what, two years ago, mm -hmm. after we had um, built a new restaurant, built what's called the Mill Village with exercise facilities, a new store, study and social spaces, um, it was deemed the hot place to live on campus. Who knew? Who, who would have guessed? Mm -hmm. And another irony is that I, you know, have now started getting emails from first-year students who are complaining that the system doesn't guarantee that they can live on Central. Who knew? But it's a fair concern, and it is something that I'm interested in hearing more about and trying mm -hmm. to work with. Mm -hmm. We've gotten in another email from Sethna, and she asks, I am the parent of a Duke sophomore. How does this model impact students studying abroad in the fall of their junior year? To you, Dean Nowicki? Well, um, I don't know the answer to that exactly. Um, with our old residential system, as well as the new residential system, a challenge that we have at Duke is that um, there, is a, a, there are a disproportionate number of students who choose to study abroad in the fall of the junior year as opposed to any other time. That's shifting a little, 
And it's actually quite different from many other colleges and universities where the distribution of students studying abroad is spread more evenly across the fall and the spring. In fact, sometimes disproportionately weighted to the spring and even um, uh, you know, slipping into the sophomore year. So the challenge is, is that we have a large number of students off campus in the fall um, who need to come back. And that's been a challenge in the old system as well as in the new system. Um, what we're trying to do is to make sure that a student who is in a house, who wants to be in that house because they value that community, has the ability to get back into that house. Mm -hmm. I can't honestly say that we know how that's going to, how well that's going to work until we run through it for a year or two. Uh, but we're working on um, clever ways to try to um, address that balance. For example, um, an increasing number of, of international students want to come and study at Duke for a short period of time. You know, so students from China or Sweden or Brazil want to come mm -hmm. here. Um, as sort of a study abroad in the U.S. and they want to come to Duke, which is great. So what we can say is, you know what, you can come, but you have to come in the fall semester. So the student who is now studying abroad and has left open a space in their house mm -hmm. has that space filled by an international visitor. Mm -hmm. um, again, whether that's going to work out, the numbers and so forth, I don't know. It is an, is an issue that we're working on though. Right. And going off that, obviously a very strong part of Duke culture is studying abroad in the mm -hmm. fall of junior year. Do you think that students might be less inclined to study abroad with the new house model, either through you know wanting to stay with those communities they've mm -hmm. created or for fears of not kind of being in a housing limbo when they return? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I think, as you mentioned, the, the powerfulness of that study abroad experience is pretty compelling for people, and I think that will continue to draw people uh, towards that experience. Um, you might see a slight uptick in, in students wanting to stay on campus because they, they really feel like they, they've connected to the fiber of, of this kind of new organization that we're creating that, that is the house. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think it kind of remains to be seen. Um, and, and I would add, actually, an interesting thing that might happen. So right now... Um, you know, we have a three-year residential requirement, but a number of students who have studied abroad come back, and, you know, they've been living in an apartment or in a house, mm -hmm. and they're now older, and, and, you know, what they have to come back to now, and this is just our, our, our residential stock. This isn't having anything to do with the residential system. Mm -hmm. um, the options they have on campus are going to be, you know, a double in a small, narrow corridor in a dormitory with the bathroom 100 yards down the road. Mm -hmm. um, so they want to live off campus just because they've gotten used to living in, you know, a more real adult-like environment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that as the house system takes, more students will want to come back to a house, and so we may have to work harder to integrate them back in. The, the numbers won't change, right? We're not increasing the number of students we have here at Duke. And if, you know, and now we have 150 new beds with K-4, and I hope to keep expanding. So... Um, the, prob the, the challenges we face bringing students back onto campus as juniors returning in the spring of their junior year will be no different number-wise than it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, what we don't know is how the house system will affect the dynamics of that. Right. But we're very interested, and this is something we're looking at very closely. And something interesting about the house model that wasn't necessarily anticipated is the big kind of moving of Greek organizations to Central Campus. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. nine Panhellenic sororities applied mm -hmm. for housing on Central and received it, which is something new to Duke. How do you think that will change kind of student culture given that most of Greek life will be centered around Central Campus? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I mean, I, I think you're going to see a, a kind of uh, new hub for, for social activity there on Central Campus. I mean, Central, when you walk around Central on a, on a typical kind of, you know, social night, you know, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, it's kind of the doldrums, but, but now I think it's really going to kind of enliven that area of campus. And, and, and another thing that Dina Wiki and, and I talk about a lot with Central Campus is this perception notion, this, this, di this disconnect between the, the quality um, of the experiences that people have on Central Campus, as evidenced by that Campus Council survey, um, and people's perception of Central. And I think that actually having this this new hub might help or erode some of that, that kind of false negative um, uh, prejudice people might have psychologically about Central. So I, I'm actually optimistic about it. Obviously, it's a time of, uh, of change and upheaval for the groups involved. 
And so there's been some you know, you know, negative feedback about that. But there's also been, uh, for me, a, 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 a positive amount of uh, kind of positive and optimistic feedback about, hey, what's the opportunity and the possibility inherent mm -hmm. in this? And, and I think it's important to note that not all Greek life will be on central campus. There'll still be, and I forget the number you may know, Pete, but a, a significant number of Greek organizations mm -hmm. on West Campus, as mm -hmm. well as, as the social selectives that are not right. Greek, Right. which provide their own, um, you know, uh, sense of mm -hmm. real social center, such right. as the one that you're in. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that what this will be doing is spreading social life more evenly across the two yeah. campuses, not shifting it. I do think, though, that it's going to make Central Campus increasingly attractive because the concern that students had several years ago about Central was that it was a bedroom community. Well, mm -hmm. now it isn't going to be a bedroom community. Mm -hmm. In fact, it already isn't because, mm -hmm. you know, starting two years ago, we had some social selective groups like Ubuntu mm -hmm. uh, and a Greek organization mm -hmm. like Pi Kappa Phi want to be on Central. And as soon as they moved out there, mm -hmm. life started. And now there's going to be even more. And I think mm -hmm. it's going to be a very lively place on those Friday and Saturday nights Definitely. because I know all Duke students will be studying on Thursday <laughs> <nights. laughs> right. And Dean Nowicki, your position as the Dean of Undergraduate Education is something new at Duke that President Broadhead created and you're the sole person that has filled it. So more broadly, stepping back from the house model, how do you see your role as the Dean for the students? Uh, great question. Um, I see my role um, in a couple of different ways. I think that uh, honestly one way I describe it is that I'm an advocate for the students. At a, at a major research university which has not only an outstanding undergraduate program but also uh, outstanding graduate and professional programs, um, it's possible for the undergraduate experience uh, to become a little lost. Mm -hmm. And I see my role as making sure that doesn't happen, to make sure that the undergraduate experience in and out of the classroom is always front and center. And I appreciate the fact that Bre President Broadhead created my position with the understanding that that was important to do. Right. Um, my role more specifically is to try to bring together the various things that affect what an undergraduate will get out of this place as a learning environment. The residential system is one that we've worked on quite a bit but really promoting innovation in how we think of the classroom, uh, connecting the classroom with the real world. Um, that's another big part of my job. Uh, trying to uh, create an environment where students are really enabled to uh, take their, their, their best aspirations and their ambitions and to build um, a portfolio that will allow them when they launch to really go into this complicated global world and really do the best. And that's, that's a broad description of my job title, but actually it's what I do and it's what I love to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately our time is coming to a close, but we do have one more very important question that we got via email from Neil. He says, great show, but I need to ask Dean Nowicki something timely. I know he sometimes plays trombone in the Duke band. Will he be there tonight when Duke plays NC State at Cameron? And does he have a prediction for the game? I, <laughs> I will be there. I will be in the trombone section. Um, I missed the last game because of a foot injury, not having to do with the devil rolling over me. Um, and uh, I certainly predict a triumphant Duke victory. I don't know what the point spread will be, but I expect that uh, we won't be feeling too nervous in the last five minutes. Right. Well, I will definitely be there. Um, but thank you both so much for joining me today. And we'd like to remind our viewers that the recording of this conversation will be online at ondemand.duke.edu. Thanks for watching. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.